So I would like to mention that uh, this is a, a co-authored project and uh, the data collection has been uh, kindly funded by the uh, Italian Center for Electoral Studies, CISE. Um, and so that I just wanted to mention. So we are looking at strategic party behavior in the uh, Dutch general election from uh, last year. So this election uh, brought actually quite some change. We have always been a very fragmented multi-party system, but now we are really super fragmented. So in a nutshell, what happened is that um, in also many other countries this happened, but the Social Democrats in the Netherlands really collapsed. They had a huge loss of 25 to 6%. Then we had uh, Geert Wilders' uh, PVV party doing super well in the polls. Uh, many press, um, press outlets were saying, oh, is this the, the, the Dutch Trump? Is he going to be the new prime minister? Well, in the Netherlands, we were a bit more um, skeptical about this, but still. Uh, so he didn't win. The, the largest party remained the, the right-wing mainstream party, the VVD, but they did lose, and PVV did win some seats. And then we had several small parties that were very successful. So the Green Left had a huge uh, gain. 50 plus, which is a pensioners uh, party, they doubled their support. And then we have a new party on the, on the right, uh, a populist party on the right, who entered the system despite, you know, already quite some right-wing competition going on there. So summing up how the, the landscape looks now, as you can see, we have really a few parties that are all around 13 or 12 percent. The two um, mainstream parties that were, I'm trying to do this in a you know, way that actually works. So the, the two parties that weren't governed before, the, the right-wing mainstream party VVD and then the Social Democrats, they were in parliament together, so they had the huge horse race reporting in the last elections. And now you can see that you know, this party really collapsed. They are still the largest party, but they did lose a little bit. So two huge parties lost. And then we have all these, these mid-sized parties here and a number of very, very small parties that are either growing or becoming more successful. And then, so what are we trying to do in this paper is how to explain these results by focusing on the strategic behavior of parties mainly in terms of the issues they emphasize. So do parties that strategically exploit high yield issues, are they rewarded by better electoral performance? And so we are building upon uh, issue yield theory from the CEO and, and Weber. Um, and in the paper, we also look a little bit more at um, the, the difference between issue positions, uh, packages taken up by voters and parties, but I leave that aside now for the presentation because we have a bulk of data and it's, it's just too much to, to present. So going to issue yield theory, this is party competition understood in terms of issue competition. So is, issue is presenting a combination of risks and opportunities, basically, and uh, the issue yield framework relies on two key distribution. Firstly, the preferences within the party's electorate, and then also the preferences within the public at large. So there are two kind of uh, strategic opportunities there to exploit. On top of that, of course, it's also important for a party to be actually credible to achieve a certain issue goal. So putting these things together, what is a high yield issue? So we make a distinction here between positional issues and valence issues. Um, and for a positional issue, the issue yield um, is high when there are three conditions. The issue, yield, the issue goal is supported among the, the public, which is larger than the party electorate, but of course also within the party electorate there has to be consensus upon uh, what, what issue this issue should, should be. Which goal, sorry, so I'm talking about issues and goals, but I, this may be uh, a bit more clear when I rely on, uh, when I come to the research design. So we have each issue presented as two opposing goals. So when I speak about an issue goal, it's about either one of those two poles. And so the third thing is among those people who are on one side of an issue, supporting the same goal, the, they have to see the party also as credible. So we have three, um, three factors here. For a valence issue, it's much more uh, simple because the assumption of a valence issue is that everybody already agrees on the goal that should be achieved, for instance, to further reduce unemployment. And so the high party credibility is the, the main factor uh, here. 
And so based on these, um, these parameters, we, we calculate the goal yield score. And so in this, in this paper, we, we look at strategic party behavior by looking whether parties exploited these strategic issue opportunities by emphasizing issues with a high goal yield versus uh, just emphasizing issues that have a high priority among the general public, but these do not necessarily give parties a strategic advantage. And so we also look at do parties mostly focus on positional issues or on valence issues? So do they take a problem-solving strategy by emphasizing valence or a conflict-mobilizing strategy? So our hypothesis, in a nutshell, are that the most successful parties that we focus on here, the Green Left, the 50-plus party, and the newcomer that gained representation of Forum for Democracy, have, most, have placed most emphasis on high-yield issues and avoided those without. And then we assume uh, the reverse for the Labour Party. And so the research design, just to go very quickly, we did a voter survey uh, where we measured policy preferences and also priorities uh, linked to these preferences. Okay, so what do you think, what of these two opposing goals should be achieved? And then the next question is, okay, you want to reduce immigration, how important is this goal for you? And then we also ask about the perceived competence of parties, both on the 15 positional issues as on the five uh, valence issues. And then we did a Twitter analysis where we collected all the tweets of uh, party and leaders' Twitter accounts of uh, one month before the election, and we, co we coded all these tweets on these 20 issues that we had in the survey. So we have an idea of which parties emphasized which issues. So in the analysis, we compare the emphasis on issues versus the goal yield of those issues. And we also put them in a regression model uh, where we uh, regress these issue emphasis on Twitter on the issue yield of these uh, specific goals and the systemic salience, which is the priorities of these issues among the public at large. So coming to the results, um, what we see here is basically that voters' priorities the top five on the left versus the party's emphasis on the right is that there is actually quite a large uh, overlap here because four out of five issues in the voters' top five are also in the top five um, that we have uh, seen in the campaign. The only thing is that refugee policy ranked first among the voters' priorities, but only 5% of the tweets were actually um, about this issue. An explanation could be is that when people like Geert Wilders talk about refugees, uh, they don't mention the word refugees, or you know, they, they, they frame it slightly, slightly differently. And then we see that uh, among the parties, the classic income differences issue um, has been uh, stressed quite a bit, actually, because it ranks uh, second. But this is actually not among the voters' top five uh, priorities. When we look at the model where we regress issue emphasis of all parties together on goal yield and the systemic issue salience, maybe I should say here that the, um, the data is structured on a party issue level. Um, so in the first model, we see that parties indeed emphasize issues with a strategic advantage for them because the goal yield predicts Twitter uh, emphasis on these issues. Systemic issue salience does so as well. So people, uh, parties both react to you know, priorities of the public at large, but also uh, to what is actually you know, useful for them to emphasize. When we put them together in the last model, we see that issue um, emphasis is mostly explained by goal yield. So our general hypothesis is that parties strategically emphasize issues that are actually you know, good for them to emphasize uh, is supported here. And then we did, of course, an interaction uh, with um, systemic salience and goal yield with uh, all the several parties to see you know, how did parties do uh, in this sense, not only in the general sense. So what we see here is that according to our hypothesis, uh, the Forum for Democracy, the new party, and both 50 plus are by far the most strategic parties because they really have their issue yields um, marginal effect size very, very large, much larger than the other parties. 
And if we compare this to the systemic salience, it's much, it's much uh, smaller. For 50 plus, it's even negative. So they really focused on a core set of issues that had very large strategic advantages for them. And they were not so much you know, looking at what does the public at large uh, want. They, as a niche party, of course, this is much easier to do than as a big mainstream party. But still, you, you see that it works. And then the next party uh, in the plot are the Social Democrats, who actually did exactly the opposite. So instead of mostly focusing on strategic issue opportunities, they mostly listen to what the people find important. And so they have a very high score for systemic salience and a negative score for issue yield. So they didn't manage to exploit any strategic issue opportunities there. The green left um, is, uh, is similar to, to the, the other two successful parties, but a little bit less extreme. Then we have a bunch of parties that, you know, both, uh, they, they do both. They, they both strategically emphasize issues, but also take, you know, the priorities at large of the public into account. And then the last party in the plot is uh, Wilder's party, PVV, who is uh, also quite strategically because issue yield uh, has a higher marginal effect than systemic salience. So he is also strategically emphasizing issues that are useful uh, for them. And so just to, to zoom in a little bit, uh, I cannot do this unfortunately for all parties because we, uh, we look you know, for each of the parties on which issues did they uh, place most emphasis and which issues give them the most advantage. So for some parties, these overlap. Uh, for, as for 50 plus, this is the case. I just show the most and the least strategic party here. So what we see is they focused mostly on these three issues. 82% was about reducing the pension age. This is really um, like an outlier in that sense uh, in our results because most parties, they focus you know, on a bit more issues so they, they don't have these high, high percentages. So what we see is that these two issues that are mostly emphasized by these parties are also the two issues that they have the strategic advantage on and they also are ranking first on the issue yield score ranking. And then we look at the big loser, the Social Democrats, they focused on a lot more issues. You see the percentages are much lower. So they, they focused already on five issues in their top three. And actually none of these is, on none of these issues, they have a, a high goal yield. So they have a very unfocused campaign trying to claim you know, some um, credit for, for what they did in the government, but they, they really failed uh, to do so because, for instance, the economic growth issue that is one of their, uh, their mostly emphasized issues, that is actually the, the issue that is owned by their former coalition party. And so they, they just really, uh, they kind of messed up. So in conclusion, uh, strategic issue emphasis is indeed rewarded by electoral performance. Uh, what we see for the successful small parties, because this is not only the case for 50 plus, but also for the other two, but I didn't show you this in depth, is that focusing on a set of core issues with strategic advantage for a party really uh, pays off in terms of the electoral results. Of course, as I said before, for a mainstream party, this is more difficult to do, I think, than for a niche party. And so these conflict mobilizing strategies of these small parties uh, pay off. The question is, however, you know, you can, how much you can generalize this to, to all parties. And then I also would like to say that there are also, of course, additional factors explaining these outcomes, because we know that the Social Democrats are in crisis basically all over Western Europe. Uh, so there is something going on that is much larger than the scope of this paper. On top of that, uh, within the party themselves, they had a leadership change very shortly before the election, someone who was not you know, a natural campaigner. So all these things, you know, they add up to the story. And also, uh, on the right, there was a lot of competition going on, and we also did not manage to capture this fully uh, in our model. But what basically happened is that several mainstream right-wing parties took over the discourse of Gilt Wilders um, emphasizing nationalism, anti-immigration. And so this, I think, um, managed to limit a bit the success of the PVV in the polls. Uh, and we also don't, you know, we cannot fully explain this in our, in our data, but the model works uh, pretty well. Thank you very much.